Despite the efforts of those who have continued discriminatory practices, advances have been made. If you had asked me back in the 1950s that we would have a significant proportion of, of blacks, for example, making major decisions in, the, in major policy positions in the, in the federal government, I would have said, no way. Here you have a secretary of state who's black, the national security uh, advisor is black. I mean, those are really significant changes, not to mention the significant increase in black professionals across the board, in universities, in corporations, in businesses, the growth of the black middle class, uh, minorities influencing music and arts and so on at a rate that we wouldn't have envisioned back then. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Mrs. Mink, arise? When my mother was elected to Congress, um, there were very few women there. Uh, she was the first woman of color elected to the House of Representatives. Um, so on both dimensions, uh, as, a, as a woman and as, as a woman of color, she certainly was a, a unique addition to the United States Congress. A progress in some areas. For the Hispanic community, my victory was a big one. And it's not only a sense of pride in seeing a woman enter the Congress, but you know, I'm the first Latino or Latina to come from a district that is not a majority voting Hispanic district. Seventy percent of the vote that is cast in my district comes from Anglos. See, it's a crossover vote that we're talking about. And that has a big impact in American politics, especially for Hispanics. Well, there have been tremendous gains. I simply do not we believe that either women or minorities would have made the progress that they have made in the last 20 to 30 years without the tool of affirmative action. Affirmative action, really making a conscious effort to diversify and open the doors of opportunity for all people uh, is really an important value in community. The present Supreme Court of the United States has been tough, hard, on affirmative action programs. Some of us think that the court has been harder on affirmative action programs than it should be, that just as the court should have left the issue of abortion to the state legislatures, the court should also largely leave the issue of affirmative action to the state legislatures and other policymakers and not pretend that the Constitution speaks clearly to that issue and determines the resolution of that issue. A lot of the people who spoke out against affirmative action really were speaking out against quotas. And, and they, were, they were saying, here was an idea that started out with diversity is important and we need to make sure people have opportunity and we need to reach out and try to get women and, and African Americans and, and Asians and make all of our institutions and our employment system more diverse. That got sort of changed into a quota system, which became, you know, if there are 7% people with blue eyes, you got to have 7% blue-eyed people. My colleague, Jack Greenberg, who was head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for many years, has written an article now that's very telling about what percentage of minority students would be getting into elite law schools and colleges if it had not been for affirmative action. And that report is sort of discouraging. My father actually went to law school when he was in his late 40s, and then he was not admitted to the New York bar. They said he had bad character. He was subsequently admitted. His character apparently improved between um, 1959 and 1970-something. The positive side is that th the admission of these students has increased the diversity and benefits of education, I think, for a very wide student body, and I think made a tremendous difference in what the distribution of people in positions in society in a way that's been very positive. My father ran for New York City borough president. He was the first black person to run for a major uh, borough-wide office in New York. He got 90-some thousand votes, which was about 38 percent of the total, which was a very large number. One of the most heated areas of affirmative action is higher education. The University of California took the top, I think, 12.5 percent of all graduates. Well, 
most minorities, almost all minorities, were in that pool of the top 12.5%. But the myth was that the administrators were somehow going way down to the bottom of the barrel and plucking unqualified minorities to attend the University of California, and nothing, but nothing, could have been further from the truth. I mean, a lot of the debate on affirmative action has been whether or not we use affirmative action to correct past inequities. You know, the part that hasn't been dealt with a lot is what do we do to deal with the continuing inequities and the continuing discrimination that individuals face in the workplace. You have to have it. I think then you have to get into the question about how effective it's going to be, what are the consequences going to be over a period of time. I can remember when the program first came into being in the city uh, in, when I was an elected official and there was an absolute <laughs> impossibility of some administrators to distinguish a qualified woman from an unqualified woman.